had it been people who look like me, had it been the same amount of people, but had they been black and brown, we wouldn't have made it up those steps. We wouldn't have made it to be able to get into the door and, bu and bust windows and go put our feet up on desks of Congress members. We wouldn't have made it that far. We would have been shot. Yeah. We would have been tear gas. We would rubber bullets. That would have happened yeah. before we made it there. We need to call it what it is. It's white supremacy. It was white privilege. And it was the call of our president. And it was encouraged by our Republican colleagues and that is why every single one of them especially because they have been the ones trying to steal this election that's why we are calling for them to be removed they should not be seated yes it is friday january 8th 2021 happy new year everybody and if you thought that 2020 was one hell of a year, well, 2021 is getting off to one hell of a start. Welcome to Raging Chicken's Out to Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. Each week I talk, uh, I speak from his, wait, each week from his unofficial Biden stand account, I talk to Sean Kitchen about the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. That was a little clunky one, but like I had to work it in there somehow. On today's show, well, I don't know what there's to talk about. I mean, uh, it's been a kind of uneventful start to the year. Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, wait. Four people are dead and many more injured after radical Trumpsters lay siege to the U.S. Capitol building. Decades of the GOP stoking the fires of racism, conspiracy theories, and ideological driven media is coming home to roost. You know, it's like uh, fires kind of like that. You know, only fools believe that you can tame a wildfire once it's set. Especially if you're the one who sets it. After hours of delay due to the Trumpster insurrection, the results of the Electoral College vote were officially counted and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be sworn into office in less than two weeks. Big deal. But it's time to break out your copies of Timothy Snyder's On Tyranny, right? Or pick up a copy if you don't have one yet. The escalating violence is part of the authoritarian playbook. This does not bode well for 2021. If people think these folks are going away, I don't know what else we need to tell you. I don't know how many times we've told you this. Well, some Democrats initially tried to simply get back to normal and, you know, time for healing and all this, right? You know, that's following the failed coup, but it's becoming increasingly impossible for them to do so. Pressured by Democratic House and Senate members and, I don't know, majority of the country, Pelosi and Schumer are now finally calling for Trump's removal through the 25th Amendment or impeachment. And this is a quickly developing story. We might even have updates during this podcast. Congresswoman Catherine Clark told CNN this morning that House Democrats are preparing the impeachment vote by the middle of next week. If Trump isn't removed by the 25th Amendment, like I said, you know, who knows? Maybe they'll push that up. Maybe Pence will be like, there's no way I'm going to do it. So, OK, we'll do push up the impeachment vote earlier. Who knows? The good news is, is that that means that uh, that Nancy Pelosi decided to cancel the plans for vacation. Right. Because initially the House was saying, oh, no, we're going to keep our, you know, we're all planning going away and breaking session. We're all going to go home. But they finally decided to pull back from that. It looks like they're actually going to get the business of holding these folks accountable. Now, all of that happened after Democrats scored historic victories in Georgia. You remember that? That was this week. That was this Tuesday. Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff victories gave Democrats control of the Senate. Uh, it's actually technically a 50-50 tie, but Kamala Harris will be serving as a tiebreaker under the rules. Raphael Warnock, right? African-American man. John Ossoff, Jewish man, elected in Georgia to the Senate. Huge. And all that happened after Trump was recorded trying to intimidate Georgia election officials to give him enough votes to give Georgia the election to Trump. Remember that? That was like last weekend. That was less than a week ago that that, that happened. Like a year ago. It's unbelievable. And the other big news of the week, I, it seems almost trivial at this point. I mean, it's like, I mean, I, to, I, to, to pull it out of my memory hole... Well, I, I've got it listed, but, you know, come on. we got to be focusing on this today. 
And like, you know, this was not just in D.C., right? This happened at state houses across the across the uh, the country. I mean, I was listening to this morning uh, about some of the other state houses. There were kind of like, you know, attempts and to break into state houses, armed intruders in other state houses, like in Washington State. Uh, I think in Michigan there was a, a bomb threat. Insane. And here in Pennsylvania, guess what? Yeah, we held the preview version of this, right? Pennsylvania Senate Republicans this week gave their one, like, the preview of what we saw in D.C. They were led by Senate President Pro Tempore Jay Corman in their refusal to seat the incumbent and reelected state Senator Jim Brewster. Corman and state Republicans actually forcefully seized control from Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, who was presiding over the session. They kicked them off the floor. I mean, you got our little little mini coup right here in Pennsylvania just to see how it was gonna go. And you know, we—I didn't even put it in the show notes, but hey, we have uh, you know Governor Wannabe Mastriano had rented a bus to go down to D.C. and see with guys pictures of him and Ron Sacone down there, kind of inciting the riot down in D.C. Great. There's so much more to talk about, but we'll leave it at that for now. And Kutztown University President Kenneth Hawkinson announced that he's tested positive for COVID. Yes, Kutztown University has some of the worst COVID numbers in PA higher education after Hawkinson demanded a return to in-person classes in the fall of 2020. Kutztown has more than 430 confirmed cases of COVID among students and staff. And Hawkinson's announcement comes at a time of spiking COVID cases in Berks County that passed 25,000 cases this week. And it should be noted, Kutztown is in Berks County and Kutztown is one of the vectors for spreading that. Congratulations on your grit and fortitude. And in more Kutztown University news, a man with a Kutztown University hat was captured on film assaulting an AP photojournalist at the Trumpster insurrection. Yeah, it's good to be golden, I guess. All right, today's last call. Yes, uh, there's lots to talk about. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about some TV, maybe any things we've been watching, some movies, something to get us away from this. Uh, or, you know, we can obsess and just keep on going down the doom, you know, keep doom scrolling and going. You know, For holidays. <laughs> we just do that. What happened in the holidays? I mean, all this kind of stuff. We'll talk a little about that. Uh, the full calendar of space launches and missions has been released, and you've got a bunch of places that are posting it out. It looks like it is going to be a crazy and active year in space. There's that. And, of course, we'll take you through some of the Free Will Brewing releases for 2021 to help keep you at least a little bit sane or give you a break from the onslaught of the rising authoritarianism. I want to remind you to tune in to the Rick Smith Show on Free Speech TV this and every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern. You can stream the show live at freespeech.org, or you can tune in to the Dish Network, DirecTV, or through the Free Speech TV app on Roku. And make sure to subscribe to the Rick Smith Show's daily podcast on iTunes, Podbean, wherever you get your podcast. And Out to Coop Live returns this coming Monday at 7 p.m. I'll be talking about the civility fetish, Thomas Paine, and the politics of the moment. Now, if you remember, before we broke, I was gonna before we broke for the uh, uh, the break, I was gonna do this actually uh, on the week before Christmas. But frankly, I just uh, I just didn't have it in me. I said, you know what? You waited for the right time. I I, I did. And, you know, I, I thought like, well, you know, is it, is it going to be past now? Is it, you know, maybe this is going to be like, you know, old news by the time. Because we were really frustrated at that point. Turns out, no. <laughs> it turns out it's actually more relevant now than ever. So to give you a little preview of that is like um, after the Tea Party victories in 2010, um, I had a conference paper that I presented and then I kind of turned this into an article that I wrote um, as part of this book on really rhetoric. I think it was on really rhetoric. So it was in, and um, it was called, uh, we are not in all this. We are not all in this together. Right. And it was a direct pushback against this kind of civility fetish. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about that um, and what that means for strategy and what we actually mean. What's an alternative to the idea that can we all just get along and pretend nothing happened? Can we just be friends? Um, so that's what we're doing out to Coop Live. And that'll be Monday at 7 p.m. If we want a progressive future, we need progressive media, folks. That's why we're sitting right here in this chair. Sean's sitting in his chair. We're not sitting in the same chair. You can help support Pull No Punches Homegrown Progressive Media today. Become a patron of Raging Chicken for as little as five bucks a month. Go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your level of support. We're expanding our network as we prepare for the fight of our lives and the fight for the future in 2021. I thought 2020 was bad. Well, here we go. 
but we need you. Become a patron for the price of a good beer once a month and help keep the media in the movement, the movement in the media. Become a patron for as little as five bucks a month by going to patreon.com slash rcpress today. And for the month of January, uh, we've got a little special running. Uh, if you become a patron of Raging Chicken for at least five bucks a month, we will send you your choice of Against the Web, a cosmopolitan answer to the new right. And that was Michael Brooks's book. Um, Michael Brooks, if you remember, he was a co-host of Majority Report. He was doing some amazing work, and he tragically died in 2020. Uh, we have some copies of his book um, that uh, we will give you if you become a new patron. Um, or, if you don't want that, I mentioned earlier, we got uh, Timothy Snyder's new book, our book, Tyranny, 20 Lessons on the 20th Century. Um, if you'd rather have that instead of Michael Brooks' book, I will send you that one, too, as well. You just got to go to patreon.com slash rcpress and become a patron before the end of the month, and you'll have your choice of Against the Web by Michael Brooks or On Tyranny by Timothy Snyder. Well, Sean, uh, happy new year, I guess. I'm not sure that that kinda... I think it's still like March 30 something of 2020. You know, I don't know. But one thing I will say, you forgot to mention, uh, yeah. big man, John Fetterman, uh, oh, right. hinted at his uh, U.S. Senate run uh, this morning on Twitter. So we're off to the races with that. Um, man. Well, and and uh, and uh, well, let's uh, just and, make it through 2021. And, well, and Mastriano gave his soft launch launch to his campaign in D.C. this week, right? So, uh, I think that uh, <laughs> might have uh, fucked him over a bit, but we'll see. We'll see about that. I mean, now, Josh, now's your time, Josh. Like, there's <laughs> well, now's the time for the Attorney General to uh, you know start taking taking names. Well, if like, there's ever a time to seize the moment and take the initiative, now is it, right? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, mean, now is this is kind of what we're getting at with the whole civility stuff is like, this is not the time to like, OK, now let's everybody kind of take some deep breaths. Let's all get together. Let's have a little talk session about kind of, you know, how we can come together. Republicans and Democrats. No, no, no. This is the time to take the initiative and lie out a different version of the future. This is what what we saw in D.C. and it, around the country. But what we saw in D.C. in particular this week was, is the direct result Right. Of the 40 years of the GOP, in particular, the last, you know, since like really the past 10 years. Right. But 40 years, 10 years in particular of, uh, you know, the GOP, the Republican Party of just like giving aid to white nationalists, giving aid to white supremacists and the far right. And, and not just the Republican Party, but their infrastructure, yes. their think tanks, uh, groups like the Commonwealth Foundation, you know, the Koch Brother Network. Yes. Like all of this has blended together and even like building upon this. Um, I mean, personally, I've been following the reopen movements here in Pennsylvania for the past eight or nine months now. Right. And we've watched these fascist, racist, xenophobic, uh, white nationalist elements just blend themselves together and really radicalize themselves as a movement, like over the past several months. And like, you know, like the reopen movement is a direct pipeline to what we saw in D.C. yesterday Absolutely. with the conspiracy theories, the fascism that came along with it, you know, claiming that the election has been stolen. Like these people have been talking about this for months now. Like this wasn't like if you've been following the reopen movement, you've been hanging out in their Facebook groups. You've been going to these rallies. You've been hearing what the Republicans have been saying about the election. You know, like you've been hearing what Doug Mastriano has been saying for the past nine months. This is a direct result. Wednesday is a direct result of the previous nine months. Like if Absolutely. we're going to break, like it's just and I mean, for like Mastriano to like deny culpability here is just fucking ridiculous. It's bullshit. Like in its most. Like it's I mean, as just, they say, it doesn't pass the smell test. <laughs> right? yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, seriously. I mean, like I was at the rally on Tuesday on the Capitol steps before the thing with Brewster went down. Uh, there were state senators there. There were newly elected Republicans there. Uh, the whole entire fucking crew of the past nine months was there. And like they said they did what they fucking said they were going to do. Like, I don't know how else to put it. Like they they like the rhetoric uh, the incendiary rhetoric, you know, violent rhetoric that's coming from Mastriano, coming from Frank Ryan, it's been coming from like Ross Diamond over the past nine months. They went down to DC to do what they said they were going to do. Right. Like, that's it. I mean, I think it's plain and simple. 
look, like, as, as they several, were right, and it's look, they, as they several, were they were ginning these flames for the past nine months. They were ginning these flames with the conspiracy theories around the election, right. and this is what happened. Yeah, I mean, this is like, look, this is uh, like I, I was watching what's her name, uh, Bradney Brandy Z- Zadrodny, I think is how you say her name. Um. Yeah, Zadrozny, Zadrozny. She's like one of these folks that um, she reports on a kind of, uh, you know, kind of the far right. Um, she's been, um, was that? she was on uh, several programs this week. Um, but she, and I, I'm forgetting the, the other guy that she reports with, um, uh, I basically say, look, we saw this stuff. We've been reporting on this. Like, they were clear. All those folks that were going down to D.C., they were clear about their intentions, right? But nobody would listen. Right. And, you know, it was like nobody was paying attention. Like, obviously, everyone from the Capitol Police, right, to like, you know, the mainstream media to certainly Democratic and Republican parties didn't take any of this stuff seriously. And like, as several people have remarked, like there was people that had T-shirts that said Civil War, January 6, 2021 T-shirts. Right. And people are saying, like, you know, you need to plan ahead to print your T-shirts in order to be there. <laughs> thing, Right. <laughs> So the, oh, I, I mean, thought they were just handing them out. <laughs> it's like it's just crazy, right? So I mean, this it was clear what was what was going on, and you know these Republicans they believed from the get go that this is going to be to their advantage to hop on this train and keep on this train. Oh, did you see like what like some of the reporting is coming out of it? Like uh, Inquirer put it like on their like headline the article like yeah. the one woman. Uh, the, this is the first day of our. Be- this is like the beginning of our lives. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like. like this is like, look, there was other people like, that were posting this. They said, we might as well call this year zero because a new beginning is upon us. Yeah. And Seriously. then Trump yesterday on his fucking, you know, quote unquote concession speech, which wasn't a concession speech. Yeah, uh, what a, yeah, he blew that fucking dog whistle pretty loud. to saying, we're all about to start this wonderful journey together. Like, what fucking journey are you talking about? Are you starting at Jonestown? Like, come on. Like, like he was blowing that fucking dog whistle last night so goddamn loudly. Like well, absolutely. But here's the, here's the thing: calling right? for more violence. Right. That, but that's exactly it, right? That's the message. Like his message right there. You see, this you know, this is where he's always been. This is how he's walked the line, right? So people have asked the question, like, well, how do these people stay with him, right? After he gives a concession speech like this, you got to understand, is that those messages are designed to be heard differently by what different constituencies want to hear. Right? What the Democrats and what the mainstream media wants to hear is Trump conceding. Right. And Trump basically kind of come in that and they think that that's OK. Now we're at this end point. But when he says this journey ahead, we got all got to get together and work together on this. His people that those folks that were there to kind of storm the Capitol, what they hear is the we in that we have to get together. It means him and them. Yeah. Against the rest of everyone else, what the Democrats hear and what the mainstream media hears. Right. Is that the we is supposed to be everybody in this country. Right. So those messages are designed and Trump is extraordinarily skillful that he's always been good at that is being able to kind of signal in both directions. Like so the way it's the silent majority, the fascist silent majority, like rhetoric that he has been stoking. Exactly. Like, I mean, you're right. Absolutely. To call it out as dog whistles. Right. But it's you know, it's the kind of stuff it's like the built fucking into bullhorn. The discourse. What's that? <laughs> it's a fucking it's a fucking bullhorn at that point. Like not even a dog whistle. It's like an air raid siren going off like. I mean, as soon as I heard that, it's exactly what it was. Right. Exactly. Right. I, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I was just, I, mean, uh, you know, I was hoping that he was going to call, you know, um, you know, um, have some sort of big meeting at the White House. So you basically get some uh, some representatives of the kind of, you know, the mainstream kind of religious organizations, as well as the Q shaman. To oh, and did you see like uh, work together <laughs> like you see Dana Bash? No, yesterday? No. Saying that like Trump set a new tone with his fucking speech that he released on Twitter. Just like. <laughs> is she the yeah. one who said that? I heard people talking about that, and I'm like, I yes. can't even get. She into should this be fired. I was she like, should be fucking fired for that. I like, heard about that last just... night before I was going to bed, and I was like, you know what? I cannot listen to this. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to sleep all night long. <laughs> it's like because she was she wasn't. I didn't know Dana Bash had said that, but I know that she was not the only one. There were there were there were several trails, and, and I want to again. I'm trying to do my best not to follow down that down, down that. Well, I mean, like because Donald, it's... like yeah, last night that speech is the day Donald Trump finally became president. Might have taken three years and fifty weeks, but that's the day he became president. Well, you know, we've Van talked Jones. about this before. It's like <laughs> Van Jones, right? Van Jones is that you know, Van Jones is really good about kind of like you know sticking his finger in his air to figure which way the wind is blowing, right? To try to kind of reset himself. And uh, 
uh, what was what I found fascinating is that what he was doing, uh, y- you could tell he couldn't figure out the wind yet, right? Because after that was going on, the, the, the storm was going. He was sitting there saying, "Well, this could either be." the end of something or the beginning of something i'm like ah he can't figure it out quite yet right but i'm like and i I, you know and he said and he said in that the reason why i bring that up he said like not to be partisan or anything right i'm like jesus christ it's like these people got to take their their heads out of this freaking bullshit partisan understanding and say at sometimes it's like it really is us against them but it's not democrats and republicans it's the, the the rising fascists and the people who are not rising fascists, right? I mean, it's you know this is something that that Jonathan Smucker has been really kind of like like pushing out to as well, saying like you can't be thinking of Democrats and Republicans. You got to think about the, the 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 people in power and the rest of us, right? At some point, there's there's different kind of partisanship that comes into play that is not doesn't have a D and an R. It's not about that. It's about the people, like cult democracy. members and non cult members, exactly. Like- like it's exactly it's it's just like exactly i mean yeah i it's (laughs) but i mean and also because like you know i I don't know how you say you know chris hayes i i told you this we talked on the phone yesterday but like you know chris hayes was on the other night like um as they were had the continued coverage of what was going on and they brought him you know he could be part of the panel and rachel battle turns to him and says like well you know what's your take on this chris and he said he's like look you know, because like the vote had begun again, they had re- they had come back into session in um, Congress to vote and accept the um, the electoral college results. And Chris Hayes is like, "Well, look, I can understand people wanting to kind of like get back to normal and show that you know they haven't stopped the working of democracy." He's like, "But when they say things like you know it's time to move on to that next stage," like he's like. This just happened a couple hours ago. <laughs> he's like, and it's like, and he's, he's like, he's like, it seems baffling. The circle jerk. It seems that insane the that people are saying we're to move on for this when people are dead. People like lost the their cir- lives in this thing. And the like, smell of tear gas was still in the Capitol. And they're like, well, time to move on. Pretend we're pretending. It's like, there is something that is the absolutely. speech is on the Senate of, floor. Oh, my like, God. Like, well, you saw. That's what set me like, off on Twitter. That's yeah. what I was like. I stayed away from Twitter until the that. whole day. I was just like, "Oh, there we go. We found the nerve." Yeah, like, there it is. I was just like, <laughs> "Like, there it is." I mean, like, the fact that like the circle jerk that happened on the Senate floor, like once to start, like it was kind of like, "Come on, let's just hug it out, man." Like, and like that's what they were doing. And I'm just like, you, I could see like if you're gonna hug it out. Right, as like the Republicans and Democrats were doing, then then you have to have like a unified like vision going forward. Like we're gonna hug it out, and then we're gonna fucking impeach this person like as soon as possible. Look, like if I were the, if, that, if I were Democrats, I mean, it's right, like, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I mean, like you think about it. I mean, like, uh, as, fuck Joe Scarborough, but like you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like I mean, I you can see like they defiled institutions, like. And like, I mean, like, I feel like what happened the other day, right? We still have the people voting to go after these votes and disenfranchise 7 million people in Pennsylvania. But like, I think what happened with the the defiling, the defacing of the Senate and the House institution might actually be a line too far for Trump. Like the fact that like they had to barricade themselves in their offices. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just like going, I'm being a little too wishy-washy here. But, like, you damaged the institution. And if there's one thing, like, Republican or Democrat next to your name, and you're partisan, and you're, like, are against each other on all the issues, like, defiling the institution is something that they can all agree on. And it's something I don't that they know. take I don't, seriously. I don't know about that. I, but, like, we, we'll see. I mean, like. I think, look, I, I do think there are people that that matters to. Right? That that matters to. Because, like, Mitt, you know, like, I feel like a Mitt Romney or a Chuck Grassley like or Mitch McConnell, but like we'll see like what happens. Right. I mean, well, I'm not going to like remember for a second though. Let's remember for a second, like the Republicans in this in this case, right? They are the ones who, for I don't know how long now, half a century, have been railing against the institution of governance. They're the ones who have want to kind of like, well, you know, oh yeah, what's that phrase? Shrink it down so you can drown it in a bathtub. 
they are the ones who have had a full assault on public institutions that have been the bedrock of anything that we might call like a, a kind of social infrastructure, right? That was that was geared towards the people. And this is like chickens roosting. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's like this is the, the thing is, is like is I would put it more like this. I think, look, I do think there are some people and I but I think they're in the minority. I think there are some people who actually really do care and hold that in. I forget who was saying this. They were talking about the, you know, uh, this being this sacred space. Right. A Democrat, you know, a secular sacred space of democracy. Right. And I do believe that there are some folks who actually hold themselves to that ideal and kind of believe in that. I think, however, what we saw on Tuesday is like the Republicans trying to kind of like, you know, whatever, scrub their reputations. Right. And scrub and distance themselves. Unless you're like Josh Hawley, who's going all in. Right. Even though he lost his book contract because he's a fascist. But he's like, even though I think what what the what the bigger concern was not that they defiled those institutions in some abstract way, but that they felt themselves perfect, per, like personally threatened. Yeah, they saw, like it took the, like it took people with fucking guns coming into the Capitol, like an angry fucking mob coming for their heads. It's like, well, may, maybe we went too far with this. Like, well, that's that's the, like, all they even did. that might not happen now. Right. That's the, the only and what they're trying to do right now, what they're trying to do with their discourse, but Republicans in particular, um, those folks who've been stoking these fires for 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 decades, what they are trying to do right now is essentially without doing it directly, basically beg the Democrats. Right. Um, to cover to them. impeach. No, to cover them, to protect them, because now they're afraid. But the way that they do this is they do this with this kind of we all have to come together. They use this rhetoric of we. But really what it has to do with is that they recognize that they are targets now, especially people like Mitch McConnell, like Mike Pence and those people. Oh, who, like they who, were who, fucking saying this at the rallies on exactly. um, on Tuesday. They were calling Mike Pence's head exactly on the Capitol steps. And let's recall like, when, when when Sean says calling for his head, we're seriously they had a gallows. And a crucifix. Up on the Capitol steps. I mean, this is like when when there's interviews with people. I don't know if you saw the what was it the ITV news um, like uh, interviews. They had a guy from the British Broadcasting Service kind of inside um, there. And you were talking to different people, and are people interviewing some of these folks who are coming out? They saw this as as a revolution, as a revolt. There was no, there was, I mean, there was no, there's no mistaking lack of clarity. <laughs> And they went in there, as you know, we talked about before the show, you had guy picture guy going in going in with zip ties. Right? There's reports now coming out the Capitol Police were fired Lynn on Wood with tear with gas a fire and tasers. Po- like you had Lynn Wood with a fire Pelosi hat on. Like this like they want like I don't like like they wanted to fucking kill her. Like they wanted to kill Mike Pence. Like this is not like like this is these are the flames they've been stoking on Twitter and Parlor and Facebook. Right. For the past like three weeks, they've been fucking screaming this out loud, and they went through with it. Right, like, like, and, uh, it, like, what else is there to say about this? I don't know. I don't but know. Like, I mean, I, just... Look, I mean, how this is what I, you know, I, I, I tweeted this out at one point, right? I mean, our version of this, but it's like really, this just shows you how deeply embedded, uh, and this has to do with what happens when you're at the center of empire, right? When you're the center of the power. Is like how deeply the kind of discourse of American exceptionalism, right, is used to kind of cover over some of the worst atrocities in like like in history. The idea that we're you know you know when people start saying things like this is why everybody should listen to yesterday's Majority Report. Rick uh, Rick Perlstein was being interviewed on uh, on the Majority Report. Um, I might play some of his uh, sound on our Monday. I would say live. But also let, go but, back and listen to the Jared Sexton Yates interview. Yes. That- uh, Sam Sear did recently. Yes. I actually bought the book because of that interview. Yep. Like, but what they were talking about is basically saying like, look, the whole idea that like, you know, this, these, this is not America. This is not the real America. It's like, what yes, it fantasy, is. this is it. This <laughs> is the America that we're in. Right. That doesn't mean, that, you know, again, can, can we have a, just a little bit of like, of, of critical thought here is that, just be, because you have about 40% of the country that is supporting what happened in D.C. Okay, I'll be generous. 
supporting what happened in D.C., right? That doesn't mean that everybody supports it, right? But guess what? The world is not divided into on-off switches. Yes, no, either or, black, white. It's not the way it works. You can have gradations of this. So what we have is we have we have an insurrection and people who don't want the insurrection. As Sean said, we have the cult and we have the non-cultists. <clears throat> the question is, is what, what will us non-cultists <laughs> do to, to, to like purge the cult? <laughs> I mean, you don't, people don't stop believing in the cult. Once you've crossed that kind of Rubicon, as people have said that Trump had done, <laughs> by the way, once you cross that into that other fantasy world, there's no coming back. Not by kind of like inviting them with a piece of cheese. Right? I mean, it's like, you don't do that by saying, hey, why don't you come in and why don't we hug it out, as Sean said. <laughs> no. Come on. That's not where it's we're like, at. We've got some like, serious, serious work to do. But when, look, and, and this is this is my, my, my concern. I, I, well, I'll, let me say this. My initial concern, I'm glad to see that there's actually now calls for the removal of Trump. I was really concerned that, you know, Pelosi was going to go in with kind of the Biden rhetoric. And again, I understand where Biden's rhetoric comes from and things like this. But, that you know, this discourse of American exceptionalism is not like if you if you read some of the international kind of posts on this stuff. And I don't mean just the international news. I mean, people from international areas get on some of these other like, uh, you know, and kind of in other countries. And they're like, we've been telling the you this for a while. You, you know yeah. who thinks you know who thinks that, like the United States is the bastion of democracy? Americans think that. We don't think that. Europeans don't think that. That exactly. A like, matter of fact, we, Europeans who have been sitting there and kind of, you know, you know, whatever. You you go down to Latin America, you show me people who think that, you know, like the US is the bastions of democracy. Yeah, I mean, I wonder like I what mean, people in Venezuela, Honduras, El Salvador, Chile, Argentina, Iran, like just name off the fucking list of countries that we've staged coups in over the past 60 years simply to protect american corporate interests like totally like I, let, let's or, see what or these power think. or just outright military and political power in the world yeah like i mean like the like it's just yeah I, <laughs> look and i and i, I can't believe that, we're, I, look i mean i can't believe we're at this point like i, I mean know. i remember calling i mean it's not surprising like people like we had a fucking phone call today and like spent a half hour not even talking about what happened on tuesday or wednesday like and it's just like uh you know we gotta really like put everything aside and address this right now like you know what i mean like this has to be like addressed well this like, this has got to be addressed and this is also the guy was saying at the start of the broadcast today is like this is also the place where we need to there needs to be a you need to go big and you need to go big fast like, like big as in New Deal, like totally. there has to be 100 like, percent. we have to like, I, I'm so glad to see that. Actually, this is what, you know, again, I'll give credit to Schumer. I mean, I'll give credit to Schumer on this one for actually being willing to kind of like kind of stay, you know, keep his ground on this. They saying, nope, two two thousand dollar checks is that and basically Democrats now basically saying we will give we will deliver on the two thousand dollar checks to all Americans. Right. For covid relief. And we'll use reconciliation. We will do what budget, it needs to take. You've got yeah, Chairman we'll use, Sanders now, head of the budget. <laughs> head of the Fed. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, also, before we get into the Senate, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, the tapes that came out. Um, oh, Jesus you Christ, know, yeah. And, like, even after that, with, like, the Hakeem Jeffries coming out, it's like, oh, we just got to forgive and forget. You know, we got to move forward with this. Like, there's no moving forward after this. Like, that should disqualify him from a leadership position in the Democratic Party, in my mind. Yeah. Like, like that... <laughs> Like, I mean, I you like that was on Monday, he said that or Sunday when it came out. But like, I mean, the fact that people were tampering down impeachment talks after the fucking tapes came out. Like, what did you think was going to happen? Like these like, I mean, like I didn't listen to the full hour long conversation. I right. Did. But yeah. I mean, you sound like a fucking mob boss. This is what we've been saying for five years now. Like, yep. exactly. I mean, like. I mean, as soon as I heard it, uh, the extortion and stuff like that. Oh, he's a crime boss. Like, and exactly what you've been saying from day one. He's a crime boss. That's that's the only way. I mean, you know, yeah, exactly what Sean's saying. We've been saying this from like the early days is that my assertion from the get go is like, look, the way that the media in particular at the time was covering the early Trump administration and they're trying to kind of like put him in all these political categories. I'm like, it's not you, you just got it. Like you start from the fact that this you have to from the lens of the mob. 
if you look at this as a crime fan family, and that's why, if you remember, it's like, you know, I, I've slipped as the years have gone on. But for the longest time, I would only refer to the Trump administration as the Trump organization. Right. Because that's how you really need to understand what, what, what was going on there. The way that, say, kind of mob communicates, the way that actions are kind of uh, communicated to kind of underlings. Right. You know, this is where you look at kind of Michael Cohen. I mean, Michael Cohen, let's remember, Michael Cohen warned about this. Right. I mean, the guy, I mean, look, this Fucking is not scumbag. an apology for Michael Cohen, <laughs> like... but we got to give the guy credit for set, t- warning everybody. This is precisely what was going to happen. That he is not going to let go of power easily. That he's not going to allow for a peaceful transfer of power. Michael Cohen said that. Right? And if you listen to those testimonies, this is why I loved the Michael te- the Michael Cohen testimonies. Or, or when he was testified before Congress. Because he laid out. And look, senators and the Congress, they, they had a really hard time even hearing what he was actually saying. The way that the communication happens during, you know, he came out to the impeachment hearings, the way the communication happens is not like Trump says, OK, here's the plan. We're going to do this. That's not how it communicates. That's not how mob can, he doesn't go and call up Vladimir Putin and say, like, hey, I've got an idea. Let's do this. No. Authoritarians, mob bosses, whatever you want to say, that's the way they communicate with one another. They are aware of each other's interests. And what will serve those other interests, but they never need to say the words exactly. Why? Because when you go to court, you want to be able to say truthfully, I've never said that. Right? You're not lying under oath because you never said it. You never told this person to do that. Right? But that's that's a structure of you know a crime syndicate. That's the way it works. And that's what we've that's what we've been living through. So I don't know. I don't know it, 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 what what happened what happened in the Capitol, right uh, you know is astonishing and I, I, I just I, I'm my biggest concern at this point Sean is just that I'm not no I'm not gonna say I'm not I, I, I'm concerned that these two lines of discourse one of American exceptionalism that idea that yeah, we've had bad times, but we're always we always going to, you know, we're always going to kind of like come out on top that democracy will win. The spirit of democracy will, win, you know, it's just that's not proving to be true. Right. And, you know, it's rested on, you know, post World War Two, like global supremacy for a while. That's helped kind of boost that discourse that, you know, America is exceptional. But um, we're not there anymore. But the discourse is not caught caught up. Right. In like very frank terms. And I think I would encourage people to, to watch Chris Hayes like over the next over the week or even I, hope, some of his I hope this is an eye opening moment for a lot of people like my mom. Yeah. Like we were talking like she said the other night, she's like, I have never been this politicized in my life. She's 63, never paid attention to politics besides the last yep. few months. Watching yep. the Republicans try to steal this election. She gets it. like, you know what I mean? And like, you know, watching her posts on Facebook, she goes, my son's been saying this for months now that these people are cult members. Yep. And like, he's like been following them for work and like, you know, following these people around. And like, they, like, she's like, he's right. Like these people are cult members. Yep. Like, like, like these people are like, like, it's just like explaining to her. And she still thinks like this notion, well, there's, there has to be some good Republicans out there. I'm like, no, they all enabled this. But here, but this like, is the test, right? This is the test. There, there's, the test has always got to be this, right? And this is, I, I was going to get to this before, but I, I just, I, we went another direction. But it is what needs to happen at this point is that if there's truly these Republicans, these good Republicans, they need, without the, without the kind of like cover of Democrats, they need to go out and on their own initiative, come out strongly against what just took place. And to actually make substantial and significant changes into kind of what they do, right? And so what, what what's happened thus far? You have people like Chris Coons, these centrist Democrats, right, who have like good relationships with Republicans. They're the ones who are sent out on cable news. They're the ones who are sent out to the reports and say, like, well, in my private conversations with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, they are concerned. No, no more of that. You don't give them cover. They have to stand in the line of fire themselves. Otherwise, they are complicit. 
they are collaborators with this cult. I don't know how else you say it. And even like, you know, in Pennsylvania, uh, no one is coming out and speaking against Mastriano. Exactly. Uh, no one. Well, in Jake Corman basically that. said, well, we don't have any evidence of him actually committing crime. So, no, he's fine. No, he only took selfies on the fucking Capitol grounds with uh, Rick Saccone. <laughs> like, I like, you know, like the. The fact that like Corman said that and like they're enabling this, they I mean, like the House and Senate Republicans in Pennsylvania have already scheduled. 14 hearings on the elections that just happened in order to push their racist voter suppression agenda to go after the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and to go after voting rights in Pennsylvania to ensure that they never lose an election in the right. state again. Right. Well, this like they're going they're going ahead with this this month. Right. And this is a couple of weeks. This is why like, I'm this saying is start- this is the time to take the initiative. Right. Because I think the Republicans. Right. They are. These Republicans are on. The, they, they are operating under the same principle that things are going to go back, right? So, but they're taking an initiative to continue to doing what they were doing before, continue voter suppression, continue the kind of like fanning the flames of conspiracy and things like, because what they believe is that what's happened this week is eventually they're going to be on the other side of it, right? And that this is going to, this is going to be water under the bridge too as well. Like all the more reason why you need to go aggressive and go right at them. This is why the calls for impeachment. I mean, look, Corey Bush, Right. And this is why Democrats have to go big with policy ideas when they have control of the Senate over the next two years. Absolutely. Like and the House. Like we have to go big to make sure we come up with these majorities and keep them. Immediately, right? They the, what has to happen right now is that the Republican like this is the two thousand dollar check, a month checks. Yeah, that, that is your out of the gate, like number one. Right. Number two, like this is where, like, again, if they if like I don't think this is gonna happen, but let's just say out of the gates, this is what you do, right? You go big with like Green New Deal stuff. A massive stimulus package that goes to the people. Right. That goes Instead you, of going to the corporation. Exactly. You go right. So we need to change our politics. Look, this is the one thing that Joe Biden's got, got going for him, right? But if he actually kind of pushes on this, right? You've got enough people who kind of like show him that this is where the winds are blowing because Biden's got his like, you know, he looks for the wind too. Always try to position himself in the center. If they convince him that, you know, now is the time to move, that there's going to be more support now for a, a kind of like, you know, to get beyond this and Biden has come out. So we need to, we need to kind of like heal the soul of America. We need to get back to this stuff. Well, how do you do that? You have an opportunity to brand what that means. That means we take care of each other. That means we rely on science. That means we kind of, we no longer allow to have these third party entities take control of our lives. We get the money out of politics, right? All that stuff, boom, gets packaged right away. Everyone should have health care. No one should be left out in the streets. Just like the military says, no one is left behind. He could do that all out of the gate. And get that, and and as the discourse around the policies, the big policies like the Green New Deal, like the elimination of college debt, right, like Medicare for all, right, or whatever versions we're talking about, any of those things, right. I mean, th- this is this is that opportunity, and I think on the state while on the state level, right, we need to be a, a similar kind of kind of aggressiveness, right. Is that it has to just kind of one hundred percent keep these people on their heels and keep on pushing them back and tie them to just what happened because they're guilty. <laughs> I mean, they're implicated directly. <laughs> they went down to DC. They like spent months spreading conspiracy theories about the election. Like, and also the fucking statements that have come out from Republicans in this state over the past couple of months, you know, everyone just needs to get along. They're like, no, you fucking were like stoking these conspiracy theories about dominion, about the election integrity, about like, all this stuff, like with no baseless claim, right. all baseless claims. And like, there's no shred of evidence. And like, you don't get to wash your hands of this. No, exactly. Like the person who's been pushing the head of the state government committee is now going to be Seth Grove, who like is the par- head chief of ALEC, uh, the ALEC, like on the ALEC, the board of ALEC, American Legislative right. Exchange Commission, like council. And he is head of like this gerrymandering stuff. And he's now been sent to lead the committee that heads up gerrymandering, heads up voting rights. We now have an Alec board member running this. Right. Like the tip of the spear of the attacks on voting rights right now in Pennsylvania is going to be on him. It's crazy, man. And, you know, before we talk about what the, what the Senate stuff and how kind of critical this stuff, let me just remind you, this is something I did not mention um, in in the official intro for today. Um, 
in the midst of all this, right, let, let, let's just remind ourselves in this moment, too, about how serious this is. Not only do we have a crisis of governance right now, we crossed the threshold of 350,000 deaths from COVID this week, right? We have now multiple states, and the guess is, most, you know, anybody who's been paying attention to this stuff knows that the guess is that this is everywhere. That new strain of COVID, like the rapidly spreading COVID is kind of like here right now, too, as well. And that the 356,229 deaths associated with COVID are directly connected to that assault that just took, took place on the Capitol. These are one in the same sets of policy sets. So the failure, what people call the failure of the U.S. to respond has actually been by, you know, it's, it's functionally by design. These people, this is what they do. They're willing to burn everything to the ground, even if it means hundreds of thousands of people dead. Right? This is serious. So one thing that just to kind of close out our first our first thing here is like one thing that thank God. I mean, I, I mean, Sean and I were back and forth a little bit uh, on Tuesday when you had the special election in Georgia. Right. You had the runoff election uh, for the state uh, for the Senate in Georgia and uh, the control of the Senate was hanging in the balance. And I'll, I'll admit at the uh, beginning of that day, I, I thought at the best case scenario was going to be a one, one split, right? That Warnock would win and Ossoff would lose. Right. That was, that was my best case scenario. But uh, I, I was listening to, you know, the hype and what people were saying about it. I'm like, you know what? I, I'm not, I just can't go in. And, you know, part of this is just kind of learning the lesson from history, right? It's like, you know, I can't, I cannot get my hopes up and I'm not going to feel cynical about it. I'm just like, I, I'm, this is a long shot, but holy crap, did they pull it out? Yeah. In historic ways. So now like, we, I mean, you know, that, you know, how important is that? That not only do they, yes, Again, there, there's people that are already pointing to the fact that Joe Manchin and people like Chris Coons are going to be absolute like assholes in this because they're going to see themselves as the kind of kingmakers because they have to you know get the vote whatever. The, the one of the most critical things to understand too as well is that what that control of the Senate does is that gives the Democratic Party leadership position in all the government. committees exactly, and that is absolutely critical. You remember they've they've gutted the EPA. Right. They've gutted most of the regulatory bodies. They've next to destroyed the CDC leadership. Right. The institutes. Have, I mean, right across the board. Joe Biden's nominations will get voted on in the Senate and get confirmed. Exactly. And if Breyer retires right in the Supreme Court, they're going to actually get a hearing on a candidate. Right. So, I mean, that's huge. Right. Now it just takes that bold action. And, you know, this is this is, the, again, a point everybody over to the kind of day one agenda that they're doing over at the American Prospect. Go to prospect.org. Look at click on that little tabs is day one agenda. They go all the things that can happen even without the Senate, even without the kind of the vast majority, even if like people like Manchin quick what they can actually well, do. We have Ossoff for six years or Warnock for six years. We have Ossoff for six years. Warnock's got to run yeah. again in two years. Yeah. Like. The fact that Warnock won is just astounding pastor of Ebenezer Baptist church. Like, you know, it's just, yeah. I mean, yeah, we now, now is the time to go big. Yep. And it's, you know what it's going to take. Yeah. We have a 50, 50 Senate and you know what though? Like, I don't know how you can tamp down any relief package after this country has experienced over the past several months. If you're a Democrat, and if you're trying to play kingmaker, I don't know how you can push an austerity agenda after what we just saw this week. Like those yeah. things are directly linked. Well, and especially like, and you look at like this, you got West Virginia, right? Where Joe Manchin is. West Virginia has been like incredibly hit by COVID-19. It's one of the poorest, states, one of the in the poorest states in the country, right? And like, I will say this is where Manchin delivers. You know, he might not be that great of a Democrat, but he gets the economics of his state at times, I, I would say. You know, and he has provided votes preserving the ACA. Like, yeah, he's is what he is. But like, I, I'm not as worried as Manchin as I am with Chris Coons and others. 
No, exactly. I think with Manchin, like, with Manchin at least, like, look, if I, if like, again, if the people in the Biden administration are going to be smart about it, they're going to go right in there. They're going to say we want an economic economic recovery. Part of the kind of the jobs program that we're going to do is going to be geared towards green energy, and we want to make sure that West Virginia infrastructure rebuilds. Yeah, and we want to make sure that West Virginia is at the front of the line when it comes to kind of building out the green infrastructure. That would be my my, and I think that would be enough for Manchin. If Manchin was able to show that he's going to bring like tens of thousands of jobs to West Virginia in the midst of an economic crisis and a health crisis, that's going to go a, a long, long way. Right. For I mean, in very tangible terms for everybody, but also making sure that Manchin's locked in on that one. Chris Coon's a little bit different because he's he's tied to different industries. But we shall see. But Chris Coon's also tight with Biden. So that might might have an effect. Right. Um, as long as, you know, Biden's listening to the right people, we move forward. But I mean, huge, you know, congratulations to Raphael Warnock and uh, John Ossoff for, for, for pulling out those races. Uh, it, it's 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 astonishing. It's historic. I mean, this is it's it's incredible um, that they won those races and uh, kudos to them. Uh, the other thing, you know, we talked a little bit about the, you know, the mob boss stuff, so we don't really need to go back into that call. Other than I think everybody knows this, I think that Trump's actions this week, have, you know, if if that was not enough to listen to his call to uh, intimidate election officials, if that wasn't enough to shock you, I mean, he just gave you, you know, the <laughs> he gave you the alternative to okay, that wasn't enough. Okay, we'll give you an insurrection. How about that? Will that help? Yeah, <laughs> and then also, I mean, like uh, I think some of the things we haven't talked about the bombs, yeah, that were planted around dc right around the republican party or uh, a headquarters around the democratic headquarters right they're like apparently were at least arrested two. with hmm? someone arrested with 10 pipe bombs in their fucking bag right they found like, a, either like a truck or a, a trunk that had a bunch of molotov cocktails all ready to go like i mean yeah like this is thank god these people aren't fucking smart they're dangerous but they're not smart well, yeah, but still, they're they're still dangerous. They're da- well, and yeah, now they're doubly dangerous too because I don't. I think there was probably like you know, a, like a tiny percentage. Like we're talking single digits, right? Of people are they were actually wearing masks in the midst of all this stuff. So, and now they're all going back home. Yeah, right. So they're going back into your neighborhood. They're, these are your neighbors that exactly. went down there. Like these are your community members. These right. are your, like these are like, these are your neighbors. Not not like, to not to uh, not to like to emphasize your point too much, but literally the vice president of the the of the school board where I live was down there taking pictures and selfies in front of the Capitol, and in one of those pictures, right, one of the people that she was with in a group was posing in front of the broken windows in front of the Capitol, like they, they are literally my neighbors, literally, yeah. So, and I'm not alone, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, like we said, they set up it here. Like I said in the intro, we'll talk a little about it here. There was a There's guy. There's a man with- from Lebanon County that was arrested. Former public codes inspector. There's a fucking public pension and stuff like that. Like, you know, someone from Pennsylvania died down there. Like, like these are our fucking community members. Guy with a Kutztown hat was spotted there. <laughs> yep. Like, 50 fucking buses were paid for by an anonymous donor in Pennsylvania. Gee, I wonder who that could be. Was it Scott Wagner who did that? Like... You know, like, yep. I mean, no, these people were fucking like Mastriano brought busloads of people down. <laughs> well, like, these are our community members. These are our neighbors. These people live in our fucking neighborhoods. Like, that should piss you off. Yep. It should make you feel mm-hmm. uneasy. Like, these people aren't going away. They came back into our communities after this. Dude, I drew, I, well, I was driving around yesterday, right? Just kind of like, picking up my daughter from school and things like this, right? Kind of going, I took a kind of a loop around in the town and there were Trump flags flying free, right? They were, I mean, they're literally down there. They went, so, oh, well, election's over. We lost, blah, blah, blah. No, the cult is strong, my friends. So, I don't know. 
Well, with that happy note, uh, we got a bunch of stuff to talk about in more, more specific in Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, and uh, so we're going to get back to that in a minute. But listen, I want to thank everybody um, who stuck with us like up until this point. Um, I really, really do appreciate everything. That, and I know I said my thanks at the beginning uh, or at the end of uh, 2020. Uh, but I want to say thank you again as we move into 2021. And, um, you know, I've, I'm more convinced now than ever uh, about the importance of uh, doing what we're doing here and trying to expand what we're doing here in terms of, um, you know, real progressive media that is kind of, you know, beholden to like no corporate entity, right? No kind of billionaire donor. I mean, you know, again, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I don't know if somebody was going to float me a million dollars to run this show. I'd have to think about that. But, uh, but no, really, it's like what keeps us, what keeps us going here, what pays the bills of our server space, what kind of keeps up um, our, um, you know, technology up to date um, is and what makes the show possible is you, right? For those folks kind of in the progressive community who've decided to become patrons of Raging Chicken. So uh, if you can, right, from 2021, help us build this out, right? Go to patreon.com slash RC Press. You become a patron for as little as five bucks a month. I mean, you think about it. I mean, that's like a good beer once a month, right? I mean, that's like, you know, you go out for lunch. That's like a third of your lunch, <laughs> right once a month five bucks a month um and through the end of january like again we've got those uh kind of you know special thank you gifts to start out 2021 uh if you become a patron for as little as five bucks a month um in the month of january uh we'll send you a copy of either michael brooks's against the web um or uh timothy schneider's on tyranny so this is kevin mahoney editor and founder of raging chicken we will be right back after this message oh wait go ahead breaking breaking sorry um always got dominion has is suing uh trump lawyers i think Sidney powell for 1.3 billion dollars in damages nice so here come the lawsuits here they come the uh the ambulance chasers are now going to be fucking suing the shit (laughs) I'm sure I'm sure we're gonna get some tort reform language out of this. Oh, good. Well, so after some of those victories, maybe some of those tort lawyers that are out there that can kind of, uh, you know, float a little at our way here at Rage Chicken. <laughs> so, yeah, everybody. So thank you. We'll be back right after this quick break uh, with more about what's happened a little bit closer here to Pennsylvania. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. We'll be right back. <laughs> I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1939. That was the day a new radio show began on CBS Radio. Welcome to the motion picture star's own radio program, the Gulf Screen Guild Show. With Jack Benny, Joan Crawford, Reginald Gardner. The show featured some of the biggest names in Hollywood. All of the actors' fees were donated to the Motion Picture Relief Fund. The fund was started in 1922 with the motto of taking care of our own. Proceeds from the show went to support the motion picture country home for retired workers in the film industry. These included actors, cameramen, set designers, and even security guards. These retired workers only paid what they could afford to live there. Eventually, the retirement home allowed working people from the television industry as well. Gulf Oil sponsored the program for its first three seasons. It was called the Golf Screen Guild Show. Over the years, the show took on several other sponsors and names. It also migrated to NBC, then to ABC, and then back to CBS Radio. In all, it ran for 14 seasons and more than 500 episodes. In its early years, the show was a variety review. It included songs along with dramatic and comedy sketches. Later, the show recreated films for the radio audience. It was a challenge to get a whole film down to just 22 minutes. Films covered by the show included classics such as Casablanca, Arsenic and Old Lace, and Pinocchio. But despite the changes and challenges, the show raised $800,000 for the retirement home by 1942. The retirement home was almost closed in 2009, but continues operations. Workers in many industries have long found creative and collaborative ways to support each other and to truly take care of their own. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Welcome back to Raging Chickens Out to Coop Podcast. That was probably one of the quickest breaks I think that we've had in this segment, Sean. Uh, that was good. I mean, it kind of uh, everything kind of I rolls mean, together today. So, 
Yeah, what else is there to talk about? We don't want to mess up the vibe. <laughs> yeah, you got to keep the vibe going. Got to keep the spirit going before we get too tired. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So, I mean, you're a little closer to this one. So, before everything that happened in D.C. this week, uh, Pennsylvania basically went out on its own kind of lunatic fringe um, in the state Senate. So, uh, so, Sean, give us a perspective of what happened out there. Um. So, what happened was... Uh, yeah, they refused to seat Senator Jim Brewster, who won his uh, election by 69 votes. That election was certified by the state. Um, they challenged it in court multiple times. They lost those court cases, and they're still waiting for a federal court to make this assumption. This is a state issue. This is not a um, this is not a federal court issue. They took it to one of the Supreme Court or one of the federal judges, judges who right. already shot down a Trump appointed judge who shot down a bunch of stuff. Um, no, and I think what this is is, uh, you know, a couple of things. They're they're they they're this is a power play from them. I mean, like, and it backfired on them. Uh, Fetterman refused to follow the rules in the Senate the other day. He said, "Fuck you, I broke them pretty much," because they're breaking the law, is what he said. And right, they voted to remove him from the dais. Uh, he had, I think, he had to get escorted out of the yeah. the chamber. Um, yeah. No, I mean, like the I mean, this this was a petty move, um, you know, like the courts have always had, even with the Republicans controlling the courts, Pennsylvania Supreme Court has always had liberal interpretations of of voting in Pennsylvania when it comes to reading the law. And basically what they said is about a couple hundred ballots uh, that weren't dated properly by the people casting their votes, but were time stamped within the allowable time frame from the post office showing that this was time stamped or it was stamped by the postage stamp was correctly or like the county workers stamped it for them. I don't know what the exact details of it are. That's pretty much it. They're trying to toss out a bunch of votes that were not stamped properly. They were not, the dates weren't filled in, but were stamped by the post office when they got mailed out. And like the Supreme court has always held a liberal interpretation of voting rights in Pennsylvania, even when it was controlled by Republicans. This is going back decades of precedent. Well, and let's remember, there's protections for voting in our state constitution. Yes. Right. And so, that's, that's the reason why the states have always, right. the courts have always taken a liberal interpretation of the voting laws because it's in the constitution. And yeah, so uh, the blow up happened. The Corman, the Republicans refused to seat uh, them uh, and they got, they became a national embarrassment. <laughs> For a day, well, yeah. Uh, somehow they didn't seem to be too. They didn't. They, they didn't think that was embarrassment. I don't think they recognized their own embarrassment, despite the no. fact that it went national. Right? I mean, literally, this was like. New and York this, Times this is something that's going to be settled within a couple of weeks, probably by a federal judge seating Brewster. For what? Like, I mean, if you were coming back into the session after the months of what happened, thinking that it was there was going to be bipartisan working together. That ship has sailed. Um, I mean, like Vincent Hughes was on the Senate floor calling these people thieves, like on the rostrum saying that. I don't know how you come back from that. Like, I don't know how you work with these people after calling them thieves. Like, yep. you know what I mean? And screaming yep. at them on the Senate floor. Yep. Like, uh, you have uh, Nikhil Saval. Like, we're not even talking about the fucking progressives that were <laughs> sworn in this week because of this. Right. Senator Nikhil Saval was, you know, pretty much like using the framework of calling people comrades. We have to call this and just absolutely pissing off Republican hacks in the state for using that word <laughs> yep. of him saying that. But like, no, he was putting out Jake Corman's phone number on blast demanding that they get seated. Like they're, they're Democrats are doing things in the Senate that normally wouldn't have done. I mean, this all started Monday evening when the Republic, when Democrats had an impromptu in situ press conference, um, you know, from their Zoom calls, uh, they did it. They preempted the Republicans. They caught the Republicans off guard and explained their legal case to everyone. And literally during the middle of that press conference, the Republicans shot off a press release saying they were going to have one. And it just fucking bombed. And this so, is what it's like when you have like you have a plan and a strategy, <laughs> right? Yeah. And this is what happens when we have a really great Senate Democrats. Uh, I'll say this. I've been saying this all along. I don't want to offend anyone, but they absolutely have the best comm staff like available any of the caucuses. And they really like the communication staff and the strategy, like they really ran laps around the Republicans on this this whole entire time. 
absolutely. Hat tip. And this is what happens. The uh, Senate Dems communication staff. I know. Like, this is what happens when you have Katie Muth in leadership. You know, you have people like who rose through the ranks pretty quickly. Uh, C- Senator Sanisiro was involved in this, who has been doing really well in, you know, Harrisburg over the past couple of years. Senator Carney, like the tip of the spear from this over the Senate Democratic caucus came from that 2018 freshman class. Nice. I got, I got this. Uh, I, I want to give this a shout out. This just came up in a, um, in a comments on, uh, on our YouTube channel. So this is uh, going back in here. It says from person from my hometown organized four buses and said that there would be riots. They're now saying that it was Antifa <laughs> and where this woman was shot and w- that, that it was all staged. And these people have their heads far up their asses. So there you go. Right here in Pennsylvania. Right. Um, yeah. Sorry. Anyway, didn't mean to interrupt, but I just want to give that person a shout out. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'll give the apologize to the person who did with the comment too as well, is that uh, YouTube initially flagged that comment uh, um, because of, you know, they're being careful about some of the language in there. That's the reason why I didn't show up right away, um, kind of your hair. So I, I caught it and posted it up. Just want to let you know. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, like, uh, this is what, I mean, this is what happened. Uh, the Denver, Senate Democrats had a strategy with this and they, they, they follow through. And like also what you did, you fucking ruined this guy's like swearing in day. <laughs> like it was a ceremonial swearing in day and you fucking ruined the picture day for him. Like, you know what I mean? Like you want to talk about defiling an institution like Jake Corman defiled the Senate. Totally. 100 percent. On the first day of Senate pro temp. Yep. Like in his leadership, like he has stained his leadership from here on out. Like he stained his legacy with this. No, you know, he's, uh, that's what happens. You got to give your sacrifices to the to uh, dear leader. So uh, that's uh, that was his making his big show of it. Yeah. So that's crazy. And so you know that was, I, I mean, I was like literally, I started getting I started getting messages from people across the country like, what the hell is going on in Pennsylvania, <laughs> right? And I'm just like. Eh, it's just another day. <laughs> it's another day. Because people really don't understand. I have to say, Chris Rabb was on uh, 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 the uh, uh, the Nomi Key Kant show yesterday. And uh, I, I, that's another one. I would definitely uh, check it out. He was on towards the end of the show, so like the last third of the show. And he was laying out. He's like, I want you to kind of understand what I have to deal with in Pennsylvania. He's like, I've had some of my colleagues, right, who won – who was raping one of the colleagues and had to be driven out of leadership and had, had to, to have had his to gun removed, had to get his gun removed. No, 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 no. Wasn't even forced to resign. They forced him not to run. Forced so him he not ran to run. The, and he ran out the clock so he can get his fucking benefits because he was within the, he was nearing the 10 year program. So in the Pennsylvania house, Pennsylvania Senate, as soon as you get your 10 years in, you have free health care for the rest of your life, your kids, your wife, your wife gets it. And then your kids get it, uh, you know, for uh, your kids get it, um, you know, until they turn 26. Some of the best healthcare in the world, in the world, yep. pretty much. So, like, they allowed Nick Micarelli, this is who they're talking about, to uh, run out the clock in that session, who didn't show up for session the whole entire time. The House wouldn't expel him uh, because of that. And they allowed him to get benefits for the rest of his life, him and his wife. Like, uh, you know, you get Dale Leach, another thing, like, you have colleagues are open carrying on the floor no it is amazing how like it took this event for people around the country to realize how fucked up our politics are when we've been just screaming about this for years like a decade now well that was just it it's like when 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 uh representative rab was out was was telling uh nomi key const about this right her little her like jaw was dropping and hitting the table like what what and she he's like that's what i want you all to understand it's like, this is what we're dealing with in Pennsylvania. What you see that happened this week in Pennsylvania is not something that's new, right? We've just been off the normal. radar <laughs> of this what's is, happening This is nationally. another day that ends in Y in Pennsylvania. It, like, it's, it, that's exactly it. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm just hoping, I'm hoping that the, you know, that spotlight kind of keeps, like, keeps shining bright because these people are, are a detriment and a danger to all of us, right? And they're, it's just unconscionable. Yeah. So, um, speaking about the big man, Fetterman announced uh, announces he's hitting at his candidacy for uh, the Pennsylvania U.S. United States Senate. Uh, he did that on Twitter this morning. Um, you know, I think what's what's happening obviously is uh, everyone's clearing the field for Josh Shapiro to run for governor. Don't like his politics personally, but that's where it's going. Uh, I don't think there's going to be any progressives challenging uh, Shapiro. 
with any cachet because that's just going to be an exercise in futility. Uh, Shapiro, you know, got the outperformed Clinton and Biden the previous two elections. Right. Um, his brand is on point after the past couple of months. Uh, yeah, so we're going to be having a really interesting Senate race uh, starting to form with uh, Fetterman jumping out of the gate first. So who else looks like you think there's that uh, might be a candidate for that that might jump in? Um, so I heard that Schumer is thinking of getting Chrissy Houlihan Jesus. or Tom Wolf to run. <laughs> Schumer needs to go stay in his own freaking state. So, I mean, that's just a rumor. I don't see Wolf running for Senate, uh, especially after this. Like, why would you want to do that? Yeah. You, just, you were governor for eight years. Um, and but I think that, you know, Connor Lamb might run for Senate. Uh, that's what, I was, Malcolm, that's what I was going to say. I was going to say Connor yeah. Lamb. I could see I could see trying to put his hat in um, pencil in Malcolm Kenyatta as a definite. He's running for Senate. Um, I don't see how he's not running for Senate at this point. So, I mean, he, you know, you saw the tweets. He was popping off that Warnock running and winning and how that was inspiring to him. Right. So uh, I'm totally expecting Malcolm to run. Um, no, I think we have a really, really good bench uh, for the Senate. And I mean, with Shapiro, like, you know, you got to give it to Shapiro. The guy works his ass off. Um, he was knocking on doors this whole entire election with yep. like out here in central Pennsylvania with Brittany Rodas, with Eugene, with George Scott. Like, so look, yeah, and he, and he, he knows how to play. He knows how to play partisan politics too. And he's a partisan. Yeah. <clears throat> That's, I mean, you know, and again, I, I like, I, I agree with you. I just echo what you said is like, you know, he's I, I wouldn't say he's like the person I'm like super like, like thrilled about as kind of his politics. But, man, I'll give him all the kudos in the world for uh, for the work he's put in. Um, and like the past two months, his brand has, has blown up. Um, yeah. The same thing with Fetterman going on TV the whole entire time for the past two months. And also the same thing with Malcolm Kenyatta going on TV the, the, the past two months. Yeah. Kenyatta has so, been I, on like MSNBC like every other day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he called uh, stunt. He called them stunt queens earlier in the week. I didn't see that clip yet. <laughs> it was but... great. It was awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> like it's awesome. You're just like. I, I mean, mean like, seriously. He says some things that I'm just like. I'm like literally like keeled over laughing because it's like. You know. I mean, this is like a like the best thing about like Kenyatta is just the optics. You have this tall, big gay black man who's built like an NFL middle linebacker. Yep. He's like, I mean, he's just tall and he's just like built like that, and like nicest person in the world. And just goes on and calling them stunt queens and stuff like that. <laughs> just great. He has like he has his weekend haircut all the time yeah, on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, <laughs> like, exactly. And no, I mean, he's, <laughs> yeah, and, like he's someone I've gotten to know over the past uh, several months. Um, you know, he came out big for Biden and Hillary Clinton when they ran. He beat the system when he ran for office uh, a couple years ago, and yeah, I'm really excited to see him to run for office for Senate as well. Um, Absolutely. So, I mean, we'll see. I think Sharif Street's going to be running uh, to raise his profile. I don't think he has a shot at winning, but I think he's going to be running to uh, get his name out there uh, for bigger and better things. So, so when does that when does that all start to really, I mean, become seriously start kicking in? uh, I think I think now with Fetterman jumping in. So we're going to have like a two year campaign, basically, is what it's going to come down to. (laughs) Pretty much. No, I mean, really. I mean, we, we, if people remember but who are tuning into the podcast, you know that this is one thing that we had talked about before is that this is going to start off quick. And 2021 is not, you know, I mean, obviously, no one's not paying attention right now because, you know, our freaking capital is on fire practically. <laughs> it's kind of weak. <laughs> so if you, you had any kind of like, you know, desire to kind of go back, you know, as they say, like, go back to brunch. Uh, well, that was kind of like <laughs> disabused of that idea. Quickly. <laughs> right. So but, uh, you know, we were saying back, you know, back in the fall that this is going to kick in pretty quickly. Um, and it's something, to, you know, a, a progressive is especially I mean, obviously, the, you're, you know, you who we're talking we have to. strong progressive candidates. It, like, it, well, exactly. But I mean, the infrastructure, right, the can take the candidates, but the infrastructure that kind of like did just freaking amazing work. Right. I know that they are already geared up. They're already looking forward to kind of like, you know, uh, about that next step. They're already out ahead in this. Uh, all the, the that next layer. 
right? Of all the kind of the volunteers that were out there, all the people that kind of get up there. We're right? focused on judicial gerrymandering now. So. Well, yeah, but this is a great time to be kind of calling back to those folks that you were involved in, uh, whether it's your DSA chapter, whether it's your, you know, kind of indivisible, where it's your kind of like, you know. PA stands up. PA stands up, whether it's, you were involved with that. Great time to get back in touch with them. Make sure you're checking out social media, kind of seeing what meetings are coming up and so on, because all these groups are kind of actively kind of in the process of kind of like getting ready to kind of organize, right? Um, and kind of for that next step. And not just the national level remember we've said this from like how many times you guys say this over the years what's happening kind of locally right this is an opportunity to kind of seize the momentum locally right not just at the national level right we have that i mean right now i have to say there's exciting things that are going on in pennsylvania um and uh what we saw happen this past election right yes we didn't get the wins all the wins that we would have wanted uh but holy crap we saw kind of like movements and organizations and organizations being built um, like never before. Really coalescing too, in yeah, a way that absolutely. I mean, so this is an work, awesome time. Yeah, like one of the things I heard from, especially from my friends who are Republican lobbyists, you know, closer to my age, <clears throat> not the old heads. Uh, you know, like they 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 took notice of how well organized the progressive movement is, and they're taking it seriously in Pennsylvania. Well, here and and you know, and a hat tip to Nikhil Saval too as well for actually you know um, continuing his writing. I mean, he's been writing kind of op-eds and pieces uh, that have been shown up in the New York Times and some other national publications, focusing specifically on what's going on in Pennsylvania, right? And because his win got a certain degree of kind of like national profile, he's built on that, right? Um, the editor of N plus one. Exactly. Yeah, and so he like, has not let up on that. And he's actually, you know, that's actually going to be really important, I think, down the road. We in, have an intellectual, like an actual intellectual Absolutely. Like a socialist intellectual in office who can write this stuff and do it in a way where it's sane, practical, and conveys the message. Exactly. So like, I'll say it like, you know, great job, comrade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, all right. So let's, you know, talk a little bit about, I mean, I mentioned this up like up top, but, you know, I, I mean, not to beat a dead horse here. I, I should. That's the wrong choice of words right now, because um, I, I I'm, do not wish bad on anybody when it comes to COVID stuff. Um, do you? Well, there's a couple exceptions here, but yeah, you know, I'm not. I mean, if I if I want McConnell, that'd be, that'd be I'd have to think hard on that one. <laughs> but I I do think that it's important, right? That you kind of recognize here is like you know, uh, Kutsan University President Kenneth Hawkinson just announced that he has tested positive for COVID. Uh, the indications are, at least what's been communicated um, to the press, has been that um, his symptoms are mild at this point. Um, but that you've immediately and they said that you know he's let people know he's been in touch with. Who knows if there's been actually kind of like official contact tracing or not. Um, but that's got to raise kind of certain amount of concern. I mean, you know, especially since Hawkinson has been held up as like the poster boy um, from uh, Chancellor um, Greenstein, right? Um, to be, uh, you know, this is the guy who kept everything open, and he's basically been the, you know, the reopen. PA guy in the state system of higher education, who's basically forced in person, um, like in person classes, who's Caused a breakout in Berks County, multiple breakouts, probably in Berks County. Well, exactly. Like the source of the breakout. Exactly. Right. I mean, it's been Valley. Like, right. And his thing, you know, he, you know, I, I, you've grit seen and fortitude, grit and fortitude. You've seen the video, you've seen stuff that we posted. You see the audio that we've kind of posted out there before is like, that's what he's said. It's like, you know, this is how we're going to get through it. And he said, because we're children, you know, we have kids who are the kind of the, the children of miners and farm workers and hard labor hands. And we got to show grit and fortitude and kind of go into the pandemic. Like somehow it's something that you can, you, you know, you can yeah, like, we gotta, muscle we gotta, your way like, through. You know, you fuckers worked in the company town. Your grandparents were in the company town. Come back to school. Like exactly. <clears throat> That's exactly what it, exactly what he did. And, you know, again, it's like so now you see that, you know, again, no one's immune, literally kind of at this point. Um, and so you got to wonder what's going to happen now. Kutztown has postponed its beginning of in-person classes for the spring. But what they have done is basically they've told all, all faculty, you know, um, even though we had a lot of online classes in the fall, they basically said, no, nah, no, nah, unless you have a documented medical uh, thing that you, you you're going to be forced back into the classroom. Right. We'll see how long that holds, especially with the cases that are spiking so much. And now that you're saying you have uh, I, I, I'd be surprised if he was the um, the only member of the Kutztown University administration that is going to be testing positive for COVID at this point. He'll um, come out of this on the other end. Really fine. Nothing really serious. Like you see, wasn't so big of a deal. Right. Well, right. I'm sure he's going to try to pull a Trump on this one. Right. He's going to try to he's going to like, you know, see, just like our dear leader. 
I've come out on the other end. I'm feeling a little weak, a little woozy, but whatever. Right? Some I mean, bleach and hydroxychloroquine. Right, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, so whatever. So there you go. So Kutsan University now has more than, it was interesting enough that it has more than three, uh, 430 confirmed cases. 431 was the last thing. It was two days ago. What was interesting after uh, Hawkinson um, tested positive, um, they did not yesterday. They did not release the um, the daily data from from Kutztown um, like they normally do, which is interesting. Uh, I don't know what to make of that exactly. But Bucks, like as I said, Brooks County has actually surpassed uh, twenty five thousand um, total cases this week and keeps on climbing. Um, so you know we are not out of the woods on this stuff, um, and uh, I can only hope that what we see with what Hawkinson did and the choices that he made is going to be a cautionary tale um, for the rest of us. Um, we shall see. Um, and the other Kutztown news, like uh, we talked about already a little bit in the, the heads up, there was a guy with a uh, Kutztown University uh, hat, like a, one of those beanie hats. Kutztown University, right across the top of it, um, you know, older guy too, not like a kid, right? Probably somebody in his, I don't know, 40s, maybe 50s or so? Probably 50s or 60s. Like grabbing, literally, uh, after a AP photojournalist was dragged off the Capitol steps, like thrown around, batted around, was, she, was shown was seen on film, captured on film. And if you want to go to our Facebook page, you want to go to our Twitter link. Um, I've tweeted it out so you can see the pictures. Um, if you, you know, maybe you know who he is. I see don't the know. video of them throwing an AP photojournalist over a wall, a ledge. I did like, not. Thankfully the guy, yeah, like, yeah, no, like, yeah. There was that. And there's also, I, mean, I know you saw some of the other images too, as well. You had some of these people that, again, I'm separating this out from the guy from the guy from Kutztown. Uh, because th these were not the same. Th well, I don't think it was the same stuff, but there was like some uh, um, journalists who were basically were assaulted. They kind of like had to come back and then all their equipment was still there. And these folks took up their cameras, like took all the stuff and, and destroyed them, stole them. Right. Took it all the way. This is like, you know, the, the following up the kind of dear leaders kind of like assault on the media. Right. Um, this is a perfect example where we see this off play out. And to see that um, the AP photojournalists get assaulted like that, um, and with the, you know, the coincidence that it happens to be, you know, one of one of the people that was involved in it actually grabs the guy and throws him into the crowd to get beat up um, is that guy with a Kutztown hat. So what's going to be the consequence of this? What's going to be the consequence of like of the fact that the vice president of the, the Penridge School District, right, uh, was there down there all happy posing with friends in front of broken windows um, to, uh, you know, what's going to be the consequence? You know, we're going to see is what Sean means. This all comes back to what's going to happen in our communities. Um, what's going to be the accountability for these folks um, who were part of an insurrection? I will say one thing. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I had a state representative who came up to me, your state representative, Mr. Craig Stats. Oh, great. Who uh, I thought was a nice he's guy. Not a bad, he's not a bad human being. I don't know. Uh, he's not bad. He's he a nice keeps guy. his head down uh, pretty much from what I understand. Uh, but he signed that letter to overturn Congress, overturning electoral votes, and came up to me and asked how I was doing. I said, I ain't talking to you. You signed that letter. And he just looked at me like, like, no, sorry. Like, fuck you at this point. Like, yep. if you're a representative and we used to drink at the bar together and you sign that letter, like, that's it. Like, it's time to give these people a scab treatment. Like, you cross that, you cross that line in the sand. And I think people have to realize that. So I just wanted to get that in there. Good. Awesome. Yeah. There you go. Here's Craig Stats. Here you go. Upper bucks, folks. Let's hold him accountable right here locally. How would we do that? And by that, I mean, I want to be clear. I'm not kind of advocating for violence here. I'm saying holding accountable, but basically getting him out of office. Anybody who yeah. signed that letter should be driven out of office as far as I'm concerned. All right. So there we have it. So uh, so there we have it. You know, right here in Pennsylvania, go happen, to, happen in D.C., all the crazy stuff. But anyways, there you go. Anything else going on in PA that you want to highlight? <laughs> no. Um, the Capitol doors are closed for the first time. Oh yeah, like yeah. in decades. The steel doors, like the steel, the bronze doors. Yes, or bronze doors. Like Pennsylvania has like state capital, like the archway, the doors going into the archway. Uh, you know, like they probably haven't been closed in like decades. Maybe since like the '60s or '70s when there were race riots here in in Pennsylvania, like throughout the state. Uh, like during the civil rights era, like I don't think the Capitol doors have been closed since that, like the main door is going in. So, I mean, put that photo up on my Instagram and Twitter page, but uh, it's, it was a heartbreaking and like, like just stunning sight to see. Like, you know what I mean? Yep. Like a building I've been going into for the past six years on a fairly regular basis uh, to see that. 
Crazy, crazy, man. Well, here we go. So uh, there's, uh, you know, frankly, there's a bunch of other stuff that I would like to talk about, would have liked to talk about today. Um, but we're going to we're going to pause it on that because I think we keep the focus on the uh, the coup attempt. Right. And what a better just 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 what a better time to have a podcast by the name of out the coup. Just got to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, out I, these I, was fuckers. Thinking, I was thinking like, you know, the reason why I changed the unofficial Biden stand account uh it's because like I'm really getting ready for like four years of shitting on Democrats in office. You know, it's gonna feel good to do that <laughs> versus like shitting on Republicans. You know, we now have the power and we can do this. Like, you know what I mean? But yeah. We're not there, there we we're not there yet. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. Well, awesome. Well, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. I want to remind you that you can help support us in 2021 by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash rcpress. And if you become a patron before uh, the end of this month, the end of January, we can send you a copy of either uh, Against the Web um, by Michael Brooks or uh, On Tyranny by Timothy Snyder. Uh, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. We will be back right after this quick break with this week's Last Call. Back in a minute. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. For the past seven years, Raging Chicken Press has brought pull-no-punches, progressive reporting and commentary to the interwebs. Our long-form investigative pieces, stories that no access journalist wants to touch, or rollicking weekly podcasts strive to advance progressive movements and perspectives rooted in the struggles happening across the country or down the street. We've broken national stories and caused our share of discomfort in the halls of power. If we want a progressive future, we need progressive media. And you can help support Pull No Punches, homegrown progressive media today. Become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as $5 a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. We need to make sure to keep the movement in the media and the media in the movement. Best way you can do that is to become a member of Raging Chicken today by going to patreon.com slash rcpress. Thank you for your energy, your encouragement, and your support. Keep up the fight. Welcome back to Raging Chickens. Out the coop, it's our last call we talk space news we talk beer news other things we're kind of going on other things that are happening what's going on so sean uh you know we barely even got a chance to talk about this because uh because of all like the crisis of <laughs> epic proportions in this country uh but uh did you have a good break did you have a good holiday yeah i did so um you know i i trolled my family members a little bit you know had some fun with that um i uh how did, so how did I the did... uh how did the gifts uh go over <laughs> <laughs> so after biden won the election officially that saturday after the election um when it was called i bought biden harris masks face masks for my <laughs> for my brother and my dad and i you know made sure they opened them up together now like my dad supports trump but uh and so my brother but like my dad is a ball breaker so he can dish it and he can like take it take it yeah where my brother like has a really the hard time he can really dish it but has a really hard time of taking it and he's been dishing a lot of shit out to me over the past four years about this so this is kind of like my payback and um what a better time I'm, than christmas morning <laughs> it was christmas eve oh, christmas so eve. yeah when they were, were visiting and um oh my brother my dad like stood up and said, oh, i'll wear my mask and put it over his crotch <laughs> Just like, <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, we were all laughing about it, but my brother got pissed. He opened it up, threw it across the room, and like, because my mom was like, Joe, here, let me take a picture of you wearing it, and just start like yelling and getting, getting angry about it. So it was fun. It was, it was, it, it was, was fun, fun watching. <laughs> <laughs> it was I was fun. tweeting it. It was great. <laughs> oh, and then, and then I think the best part of this whole like sequence, um, we were talking about politics. And I was trying not to. My brother's like, I was like, listen, I was like, Trump destroyed these institutions. 
And my brother goes, no, cultural wokeism destroyed these institutions. And I went, thanks there, Dave Rubin. Yeah, exactly. And his response was, how do you know I listen to Dave Rubin? I'm just like, <laughs> uh, you kind of just told on yourself. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, and he's just like, oh, right, right. he got so fucking angry that I called him out. I was like, Joe, you know, like, not even people like in the conservative movement take Dave Rubin seriously. Yeah, exactly. Like, like he was only he was just on the grift and he stuck on the grift too long and didn't jump off with everyone else and now he's fucked. Right. And now he pigeonholed himself into the grift and he's just like, that's not true. Yeah. <laughs> just like because my brother, like I had these assumptions about my brother listening to Dave Rubin for a while, just from like the way he talks right, and right, share right, stuff right. and like he is like that type of Dave Rubin personality where like my brother's actually is smart, uh, 4.0 GPA in college with, uh, you know, in a math, as a math major. So like he is like he, down that road and he thinks that like numbers are the only arguments that people can make and not framing and stuff like that. So he's like that type of like social Darwinist. <laughs> like, and I was like, man, this is Yo, I was like, I've been thinking for months, like, joke, man, you're like a Dave Rubin supporter, aren't you? Like, and I had to like call him out on it somehow. And as soon as he said cultural wokeism, I'm like, okay. I was like, there he is. now we're going. Like, there we go. <laughs> Time to go. <laughs> I was like, you just told on yourself on that one. Like, that is like the key words. I was like, oh, so you listen to Dave Rubin, don't you? And he was like, uh, 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 what do you mean? <laughs> just like, <laughs> how do you know? <laughs> so you're a smart guy listening to a dummy. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. funny <laughs> that's interesting and I, and I mean i feel like i could run intellectual circles around my brother when it comes to politics and framing because it's just like he believes that like framing shouldn't framing argument shouldn't be involved in politics because it just i'm like no that's actually just how politics are so yeah exactly like, <laughs> or you should be like okay so what's the alternative it's like okay 42 let them die 42 that's my argument. <laughs> you, know, it's like, you know, like, it makes no sense, right? I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah, so, like, he thinks that, like, stats and numbers should make the argument, not, like, heartfelt framing of issues and, you know, bleeding heart liberalism and stuff like that. And, you know. Yeah. Like, I was waiting to say he's a classical liberal. I was waiting for that to come out. <laughs> I should have said that. I was like, oh, let me guess, you're a classical liberal as well? You're not a Republican, Joe? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it's actually it's funny, like dropping that, like, you know, air quotes, Trump card on someone for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was pretty good. Um, bought myself a camera lens, still waiting for it to show up. So looking forward to getting that. Very good. Um, Going to have some fun, you know. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it was just nice to be home for a few days. Uh, my niece and nephew, my niece was sick. She got me sick, got the rest of the family sick. Thankfully, it wasn't COVID, but it was just like a lingering cold for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, you know, I went through like three boxes of tissues afterwards. But no, it was it was it was nice. It, it was a good time. Uh, yeah, we visited my aunt down in South Philly. Um, so that was nice. Nice. Nice, nice. No, I, I, it was a, it was a good around here. It was very kind of like quiet, um, which was actually really nice to just. Uh, my wife had off for a kind of a, a good chunk of the week, and um, so we got to kind of all be together as a family for you know without having to travel. I mean, that it was the kind of the one upside of having to be forced into quarantine. You know, over not quarantine, but you know, with a lockdown or whatever you want to call it, not travel, whatever. Um, for COVID, is that you know we just got we didn't have to go see my see my folks, although I miss them like crazy. Like we usually go see my parents up in um, up in New York um, break. So, but not having to travel just kind of like was much more kind of low key kind of uh, kind of time, and that was really nice. Um, um, had a little bit of rest, which was good. Um, nice Christmas morning, but you know nothing. <laughs> kind of crazy eventful and it was really nice we actually watched my both my kids actually this year stood up um for to watch the ball drop <laughs> for i mean both of them to midnight i went um, to bed fuck that <laughs> yeah no it was it was it was actually something it was kind of one of these milestones where we're kind of we're all up like again and they were kind of actually looking forward to it this year which is kind of which was kind of fun so um so yeah so cool so yeah, it was a good break, I guess. And now I'm actually kind of, you know, putting all my stuff together for to get back to going to back to campus and back to classes. I was going to say, I haven't. Um, so excluding Wednesday night, it's been a month since I had a beer. 
<laughs> oh, there you go. You know, I've just been, yeah. I mean, like, I just wanted to like, I needed that time to like take a break from that stuff. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah like th- this election had me drinking and smoking so much fucking yeah, weed and beer. <laughs> like, yep. I just, I. It's nice to like take a break with that. Like, you know what I mean? Just like, so it's it's been you know continuing that break. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to. Uh, buying a car this year you know getting money getting money together for that and start putting money aside for maybe a house out here in harrisburg so i've been it, it's weird been going through like those numbers like you know what i mean yeah 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 no no exactly it's, yeah so exactly well that's good well i won't belabor the space stuff too much this week everybody so uh so you know but um God. The, the yeah <laughs> good <laughs> The uh, but I have to say is like there's uh, some cool stuff ahead. If I if I can you know again find a way of pulling out like of a short show where I can just do it, it looks like it's going to be interesting. Uh, there's a bunch of bunch of different organizations that put out the, kind of like the calendar of the space launches and stuff like that. So CNET has got one, and some of the highlights are things like uh, you know the Starship uh, Starship S uh, SN nine right. So you remember that uh, that's the the SpaceX one, the big Starship one, the one that. The, the last one exploded. This was like the next generation of it. Um, they just did a rocket test on it um, yesterday, I think. Yesterday, maybe two days ago. But um, there's going to be more of that going forward. Um, you got NASA's Perseverance rover is going to land on Mars um, this year. Boeing is now getting into the um, the test. They're supposed to be, they have their Starliner, which is kind of like Boeing's version of the uh, what SpaceX is doing um, to be able to basically have U.S. based launches to the international space station so boeing is supposed to actually um have its first launch of that the large hadron collider apparently has been offline for a long time and that thing is now powered up right um which is well it will be powered up in march which is kind of cool um you also have china uh the is i think it's tianwen rover tian one rover that's also gonna be landing on mars so it's gonna be a big year in mars there's gonna be a total lunar eclipse there's gonna be all sorts of kind of cool stuff um, uh, so, uh, the DART mission, which is going to be the first attempt to kind of divert asteroids, uh, like, uh, and first test is going to happen. So a whole bunch of stuff like that, um, which is pretty, which is pretty cool. So we'll get to some of that as, as they kind of get closer, but, uh, I will try to put a link to the show uh, in the show notes to the calendar. If anybody who's kind of curious about that stuff and wants to check it out, I know Sean will not, um, but that's, uh, <laughs> it's okay. Um, on the free will score. So as you all know, if you're joining us for the first time, you know that uh, I'm always kind of looking at the uh, what's happening with free will. Uh, they've got some great releases. I did have some, I did pick some up for the holidays. Um, and there's two kind of ones of note that I would strongly, strongly recommend. Um, this is not a brand new release. This was released before the holidays, but there's one that's called uh, Corvus Ideas. Right, it's got a nice picture of like a raven um, kind of on it. And it is an imperial stout with raspberry chocolate and milk sugar. It was absolutely delicious. It comes in in a pretty heavy uh, 11.5 ABV, but it was a- absolutely delicious. I absolutely loved it. Um, another one, which took me by surprise, I was not um, expecting this um, because when I was first looking at it, I'm like, eh, I don't know if this is going to be kind of right within my uh, kind of, I don't know, in my lane, so to speak. It's called Brain is Just a Jellyfish, right? It is a sour IPA with apricot, vanilla, and milk sugar. It's only uh, 6.3% ABV, but it is delicious. (laughs) I was like, whoa, what is this? So I was very pleased with that. I'm glad I kind of decided to kind of give it a shot. They do have some, uh, the other one that's come out, this is kind of like, uh, it's the latest version of it, the Judo Refinancing. Um, that's a kind of really good. They they released that last year. Might have been the first year they they did this. Um, no, no, they've actually had it out a few times. But that's a hazy IPA with key limes and milk sugar. Uh, it's hopped with cashmere and lemon drop, coming in at six point four ABV. Um, this is uh, this is their notes on it. This is a reimagined take on an old favorite. It was brewed with a base of uh, pale malt and flaked oats, and then dry hopped extensively with citrus bomb, cashmere, and lemon drop before fermenting atop hop, uh, heaps of key lime puree. It was re- it's really good. I like this better um, than the previous version, I have to say. The first one was kind of had, it was a little bit too dry when it came out for me. I uh, just, just didn't like the, the finish on it. This one was, ap- was absolutely delicious. Uh, and finally, there is a new release, which I have not had yet, um, which is called Delta Blues. Uh, and that is a double IPA with cashmere, Eldorado, Amarillo, and Eureka coming in at uh, 8.1 ABV. 
And their description on this one is brewed with flaked oats and a touch of wheat hopped in, uh, hopped in the boil with cashmere, amarillo, eureka, then dry hopped with El Dorado and more amarillo and eureka. The carefully interplay of semi-classic West, West Coast hop characteristics with a new age look and feel, hazed out with soft initial notes of tropical coconut and white peach, which quickly cuts to a finish on the dry side. So um, that's available too as well. And that comes in at 8.1 ABV. Those are all available on uh, freewill, freewillbrewing.com store that's freewillbrewing.store and um you can go ahead you can order ahead of time you can pick it up in the perksy location um uh you can pick it up at the uh forgetting the place again i forget it every single time at their other location what's that place called again sean uh peddler's village peddler's village you can pick up the peddler's village location and uh or you can actually have you want to hit the uh 85 dollar mark you want to order a bunch of it maybe get together with some friends and have it shipped directly to you at any address in pennsylvania or virginia or washington dc that's right they uh free will is now shipping to pennsylvania virginia and washington dc um if you get uh hit that 85 dollar mark uh get over 85 dollars in order uh, you can get free shipping directly to your door um uh, which can be well worth it especially as we're getting these big spikes um in COVID so right now. Joe Manchin came out against two thousand dollar checks just now, so I'll take everything I said back in the beginning of the podcast. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I, I think that's his signal that he wants something, but but we'll see. Maybe, maybe I'll be wrong. Uh, maybe I'm being a little bit too hopeful on the ability here, but I think it's going to be a hard sell to people of uh, West Virginia that they don't need two thousand dollar checks. And I know his argument is this, right? You know his argument on this one. No, I haven't seen the it, argument but. has been and mentioned to some other folks to say that, no, you should run it through um, you run it through the regular unemployment system. Right. So you should get bigger unemployment things. So, again, they're trying to do this kind of who's the deserving who's deserving of the of the of the money is really kind of what the the mansion is playing on that card. Um, but I think it's going to be um, it's going to be hard for him to hold that line, I think, especially if the Democrats have a strong push on it. Um, so we'll see. This is his first attempt to be the kingmaker. So we shall see what happens with this. Um, but we, there's got, there's some time between now and uh, when this is going to happen. So we shall see. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, it's really amazing. Uh, speaking about these two thousand dollar checks yeah. to watch Mitch McConnell fuck this up royally and just not vote on it. Like like days before the uh, Senate election. You know, I mean, if he would have fucking voted on that, he would still be in power. It could be. It could be like, like talk about political miscalculation on his end. Like, well, we shall see. I I would guess uh, that we are going to good work on the on the House Democrats for making that an issue. I mean, and sending that over to the. I mean, it's probably one of the smartest things Pelosi did. You know, in recent memories, like oh, he said, two thousand dollar checks. Okay, standalone vote. There you have it, man. Well, I'll tell you, I uh, I would assume uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Um, I'm going to say that a lot is going to happen between now and next week. <laughs> so uh, we will not be uh, wanting for things to, to talk about. So we want to thank you all for joining us today here in Out to Coop. Um, and for those folks who have been kind of like uh, hopping on our uh, YouTube channel, want to make sure that, look, if you're, you're listening to this podcast or if you're watching us right now on YouTube, uh, make sure you hit that kind of subscribe button. Make sure you hit that little bell, ding that bell to make sure you get your reminders so you can join us live every time we go live. Um, but uh, we build out that subscriber base. You know, the more that you kind of help us get the subscriptions up there, the more that people kind of see our content. If you subscribe to us on iTunes, you subscribe to us on any other podcasting, make sure that you like us, make sure that you leave us a review that helps other people find us too as well. So like us, give us that positive review, give us the five stars, um, let people know why you listen to us and what you like about what we do and kind of boost us up in those ratings so other people get to find out um, kind of our, to find us when they're searching for podcasts like this one. Thanks for all for tuning in for today. I want to remind you, you become a patron for uh, Raging Chicken for as little as five bucks a month by going to patreon.com slash RC Press. If you become a patron before the end of the month, before the end of January, we can send you either Michael Brooks' book, Against the Web, or Timothy Snyder's book on tyranny. Anything else for the good of the order, Sean? Um, yeah, I no, really wish I would have seen uh, Connor Lamb kicking the shit out of Scott Perry on, this, on the House floor this week, but unfortunately it didn't happen. Mm. Would have loved to have watched it happen. No I mean, I, I, if that would have happened, I would have donated to Connor's campaign. <laughs> oh, but, God. you know, <clears throat> sorry. 
just have right. to get that out there. All right. Well, let me. Okay. My, well, so you could, uh, here's my last thing for today. This is kind of brings us back full circle to what the insurrection at the state capitol. Um, this was just post uh, published in uh, Raw Story a few minutes ago. Uh, is that some of uh, President Trump's supporters, uh, part of their goal, um, stated goal, right, uh, when they kind of busted into the capitol was to, and I quote, hang Mike Pence. Which is exactly what they were saying. Uh, like Ken Matthews was saying this, everyone was saying this at the insurrection rally on the Capitol steps in Harrisburg on Tuesday. So, yep. well, here it is, Travis Geddes, right? So, it, just so that you're all clear that this was an orchestrated message, <laughs> right? So, this is what they say. So that the fact it's no coincidence that they were saying these things here. But the president's supporters, this is from the Raw story, uh, the president's supporters stormed to the U.S. Capitol on Wednesday as Pence presided over the congressional certification of Joe Biden's election win, and video captured some of them threatening to execute the vice president, who Trump had signaled it out in a speech just minutes before they burst into the building. Hang Mike Pence. Hang Mike Pence, the crowd chanted as alarms sounded after the mob broke into the Capitol. Photographs of some rioters carrying flex cuffs and used in restraints by law enforcement and a gallows set up outside the Capitol. And the vice president was taken to safety along with the lawmakers. So if you need any more evidence, there's going to be more coming out all this week. But this was uh, something that anybody was associated with this. Anybody who fanned these flames or stoked it or helped support this kind of like this treasonous activity needs to be held accountable. So. Yeah. All right. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. Remind you that we'll on uh, Out to Coop Live. We'll be going 7 p.m. on Monday, and we'll be talking about the uh, uh, the fetish of civility, Thomas Paine, and some other stuff. Um, but until then, we'll see you right back here next week. Thank you all. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. I leave you on the way out with our Jonathan Mann outro. Thank you once again to Jonathan Mann for letting us use his song. Um, and thank you all for who have supported us over the years, and uh, we hope that you will join us even more here in 2021. See you, everybody.